It is Locked on Jazz for the 13th of September. A group of players who didn't believe in each other. A touch point to pivot. Tapped out. And opening a window to compete for a title. The key comments from Danny Ainge and Justin Zanuck. And we're discussing it next on Locked on Jazz. Bum 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 pow. You are locked on jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. How are you? I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA Insider. This is Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz, giving you insight, expertise, geeky numbers. And hopefully making it way better to be a Jazz fan each and every day. Thanks so much for making Locked on Jazz your first listen. We are free and available on all podcast apps as well as on YouTube. Thumbs up. Throw me a comment of your team every day in the comment section of YouTube. Send me a little note on Twitter at DLock09. Always like to hear from you. Uh, For all those of you who I saw yesterday at the Gail Miller Leadership Golf event, uh... Over for Salt Lake Community College, great to say hi and see you. For everyone who kind of always says to me, you make it better to be a jazz fan, I don't know if I react correctly, but that's the ultimate compliment, and I super appreciate it. Um, I have decided that I, I don't, this is a personal issue I should just probably talk to somebody who, who's a professional about, um, but I have decided I am the single worst compliment acceptor in the world. Um Maybe some neurotic thing that I never, you know, who knows? Like some psychologist, Dr. Phil, someone can probably guess. Somebody you out there is a professional of why. But every single time someone compliments me and then they leave. And then I always think to myself, oh, I should have said this. Oh, I should have reacted this way. I never know what to do. Anyway, so if you ever tell me that I do make it better to be a jazz fan every day, And I don't react as I should have. No, in my heart, I did. Um, So anyway, oh, let's start the show with David's 52-year-old personal insecurities. All right, Danny Ainge yesterday. A group of players who didn't believe in each other. Honest comment. Headline maker. Bomb thrower. Eh, really honest. Bomb thrower, I'm not sure. Surprising to hear. But if you actually go back to the Quinn Snyder final press conference, Quinn had two comments that maybe were a little bit more not as blunt that I don't think were that far off. One is Quinn said multiple times in his closing press conference, we needed a spark. Okay, like a spark, in other words, ignite a fire amongst the group. Maybe Quinn didn't use the word believe in each other, but Quinn's comment is the exact same. That this group, for whatever reason, as it was at the end of the year, just didn't have a zest and a pulse and a bump to it. And in and, and Danny's interpretation of that is that they didn't really believe in each other. They kind of, it's, you know, if we use a golfer analogy, that they they had put a shanked enough or, or pushed enough balls into the trees that they were getting to the tee box with a great level of trepidation and without a lot of confidence. And, you know, what Quinn was basically saying is we need to put a few balls in the middle of the fairway. Um, And frankly, I know from talking to Quinn that he really thought that the Donovan to Rudy play could have been it. And then when it wasn't, it was just like, whoa, Um, how did, you know, it just didn't seem to be there. And if you think about it, Quinn's other comment when I went back and looked at Quinn's press conference was values I want to see on the floor. I didn't see the values I want to see on the floor. Well, that's the, that's the same. Again, Danny elaborated a little bit into a group of players who didn't believe in each other. And when Danny elaborated on it, you know, he talked about guys who who didn't want to rely on each other, who didn't want to, who didn't trust that the other guy was going to make the play. And so, you know, with, with all good intentions, nothing negative, they would then go try to do it themselves. Right. And that's, you know, that's what Ainge, I asked Danny, like, what is it? And he said there was a collective lack of resolve. They were doing it on their own, on the floor. Adversity and resolve of a team with a true belief did not exist. And so I think this I think this is probably it's a it's an interesting comment to hear. Um 
it's a really interesting idea of like, what do you do if this is the case to try to fix that? And maybe after the amount of scars that this group had had, that wasn't an option. If you, if you walk through the scars, they're pretty extensive. A lot of playoff losses, a lot of unique things. And I hate to say this because this, uh, this is cutting. This group's resolve was always lacking. Uh, that is the most honest comment I can make to you about this group's result. Whether it was up 3-1 against Denver. I mean, if you go back to the first half of game seven against Denver, they come out flat. Like, that's pretty bizarre. Whether it was the resolve when things went awry against the Clippers. It was also kind of a theme throughout the time with this team, right? We talked about it a lot. Like, blown leads, blown this. And it hit a maximum level by the end not just playoffs but there was you know Donovan was just horrendous in the clutch to end the season probably because he's trying to do it himself and doesn't believe in those around him as Danny is saying probably is that because they needed a spark as Quinn saying probably because they didn't represent the values of what they wanted to see on the floor and this team starts to lose close game after close game and they lose leads right I mean we this is pretty undeniable and then the big the big moments, right? So the big scars where there really was like a cut and they were bleeding and it had to be sutured up again. There's the COVID breakout. That's a broken team when they go to the bubble. Quinn Snyder's greatest work as a head coach is probably in that bubble where he gets that team back together, gets them to bond. Jordan's a huge part of that. Uh, Jordan and Joe is kind of stem a relationship and then that kind of brings Rudy and Donovan back together and then, but then they lose the bubble. Maybe Quinn's the next greatest coaching job is the fact that he gets this team during COVID to learn how to play well. They get the number one seed. They have what I think, in, and I've kind of said this, to this group is the outlier year of this group. Like if you look at this group, it was 49, 50, 51, then there's this weird jump in a weird year where I think the players and coaching staff was engaged at a level that nobody else in the NBA was and did their job better than anyone else in the NBA. And it led to wins. And then they get in the playoffs and they have the massive scar, which is the loss to the Clippers after Kawhi Leonard gets hurt, in which, frankly, they just don't recover. Right? And then the season has all of it. They play without Rudy and they lose the lead in Detroit without Rudy and Rudy comes back from COVID and can't let it sit and he takes the Devin Booker shot and right. We don't need to rehash it all, but it's pretty, it's pretty clear that a group of players who didn't believe in each other, who then went to go play by themselves and lacked resolve is a pretty accurate comment. It's not like, it's not as though it, it it's it got a lot of headlines and it should it's a it's a telling comment but it's pretty it's and it's honest and it's pretty hard to deny it's too bad um you know the what what jumps out to me about this in thinking back on it if you take the don't believe and and I always look at um I love the Stephen Covey Seven Habits of Highly Effective People quote about you always have to look at the world from someone else's lenses. Um, I actually think it's kind of the essence of life. If you're going to run a company, if you're going to get along with people, if you're going to do anything, you've got to look at it from someone else's lenses. This one's a little different than that, but it's the same lenses comment. If you don't really believe in the group and you don't really believe in your teammates, let's go with that. We're, we're riding that today. When they do things that are different or unique or in some way, shape, or form out of the norm, if you don't believe in them, it accentuates that viewpoint. If you do believe in them, you're like, that's cool. Look at what he does. We believe in him, right? Like, I know I, this is the only analogy that, that comes to me just because of the world I live in. So the um, women's... College golf season started yesterday. Congratulations. By the way, uni the, U the state of Utah, UJGA, uh, Jeff Thurman's program, nine girls in the state of Utah are playing Division I golf out of that program. In the and they're actually all in the state. Nine girls in that program made their college debut yesterday as a Division I uh, athlete or, or, on, or on teams. Not all of them debuted yesterday, but incredible. So tip of that. But anyway, 
There's a girl out of Idaho. Her name's Kelly Anstrand. She's playing for Nebraska. Um, she made her college debut yesterday for Nebraska. And she, um, she shot, I think she's 12 under par after two rounds. And she shot a 36-29 on the second 18 of the college tournament yesterday. She can do whatever she wants right now. Her teammates will look at her through the lenses of that. This is my analogy. Like, where's he going? Is the team, she can now, she can like eat with her fork upside down. She could like cut with the knife wrong. She could decide she doesn't sleep. Whatever she does right now, whatever weird warm up thing she wanted to do, her teammates would look at her through the lenses of like, that's cool. We're good. You college debuted and have a four stroke lead on the rest of the field in a major tournament, and you dropped a 29 with seven birdies on the back nine to close the thir- your first ever 36 in college play. Like, you, w- w- you can do whatever you want. If she'd shot at 83, you're looking at all those things as though she's right. And that's where the jazz had gotten, I think, is that when you when you don't have this belief and you have scars, and then your teammate starts to do something differently than they've done before, or you look at you look at them with a little less of a positive ilk. And that's I think what had taken. So a group of players who didn't believe in each other. The scars of the past destroyed this team. We'll continue to talk about it, but I think one of the things is we've always wanted to do this rehash. Like, is it the Azabuke tra- pick? Is it the Mike Conley trade instead of something else? Sure. There's moments in time where you can look at transactions that we made. Was it the Derek, Fa- the Derek Favors trade, signing and trade is, is going to haunt us for a while. Um, but the fact is it was this group's collective lack of juice that I think, and lack of belief in each other, That just didn't happen. And that's why winning a championship is nearly impossible. Today's show is brought to you by our good friends. By the way, coming up, uh, tapped out, touch point to pivot. The next two most important comments. Those both came from Justin Zanuck. Uh, Today's show is brought to you in part by Murdoch Hyundai. Excuse me, Murdoch Chevy. And I like um, Murdoch Chevy located in Woods Cross. Also located out in Logan. The Chevy lineup of trucks, this is like a great time of year as we get down toward the the bottom of the year to start uh, getting some trucks and things of that nature. Um, And big vehicles, Suburbans, Tahoes, and Chevy's got the best there are on the market. So go check it all out at Murdoch Chevy, located in Woods Cross and in Logan, and no different than Murdoch Hyundai. You've got the Murdoch's commitment to Utah. You've got this great lineup of cars. The Chevy trucks are unbelievable. And if you want to email me first, at dlock09 at gmail.com. I will get you out a VIP experience. It's all at Murdoch Chevy in Woods Cross. Today's show is also brought to you by Built Bar. The Built Bars are out there. The bi- great tasting, the out the cookie dough p- chunk puffs are still there. I think I check every day nervously because I have so many at the house that it's I, I'm, I'm probably not supposed to order more, but I'm so nervous that we're going to run out of the ch- cookie dough chunk puffs. The uh, brownie batter, coconut marshmallow, banana cream pie, churro puffs, all with amazing macros for you. Let's look at the coconut marshmallow puffs, 140 calories, 17 grams of protein, six grams of sugar, collagen protein, in fact, that is easier to digest uh, for you in a candy bar-esque taste or flavor for you. 130 calories, 2.5 fat grams, four net carbs, four sugars, and 17 grams of protein. It's all available at Built.com, use the promo code LOCKEDON15. That's LOCKEDON15 to get 15% off at Built.com. Uh, we've got a bunch of exciting things coming up at Locked On for you. We're going to do our top 50 players in the NBA that move the line, courtesy of Bet Online. Where will, where will Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert come up, and will we still defend them if we don't agree with it, even though they're not on our roster? Who's the number one line mover in the NBA? Kind of an interesting Thing going on. Plus, great work so far over at uh, NBA Big Board, our draft pro- our draft podcast, and that's available for you if you want to jump aboard and grab that with the crew, considering where the Jazz are as your second listen. All right. Um, part two was the comment from Justin Zanuck that we had a touch point to pivot. And we've talked about this a lot on Lockdown Jazz, and maybe this is just a self-fulfilling, but I thought the conversation yesterday subtly reconfirmed kind of the path we thought the Jazz were taking in the offseason and the path that they did take in the offseason. So, you know, what Justin basically says is, hey, we're in a situation where we lacked, 
we lacked cap space and we lacked draft picks. They had had three cycles in which they had gone through trying to improve this roster as we knew it, right? So they lose to the Clippers and they have that offseason and they aren't really able to do much. They do Rudy Gay and Hassan Whiteside and we can discuss whether, you know, that, that clearly didn't have the positive impact we'd hoped. They go to the trade deadline and can't get anything done. They go to the next opening, which is this offseason, and they can trade Royce O'Neal for a first-round pick, which is a great trade. You have to make it. It doesn't necessarily make us better. And what was interesting is that Justin said we were tapped out. And what he also said in there is basically we were asset poor and we were not in the conversations. So with no cap space and no draft picks and players that didn't move the meter on trades, there wasn't a route. They basically, I thought yesterday said, hey, we could have not been at this point and we tried, but we didn't have a route by which with this group to be able to alter it enough to improve it and make a real run at a championship. Now, the first question that I've just kind of assumed you have, Uh, on your feelings on this is that this group wasn't capable of winning a championship. Like that was, that was an in, in, you know, it it was, didn't believe in each other. Scars of the past tapped out. Do do you, did you buy that? Let me know at DLock09 on Twitter or in the comment section on YouTube right now. Do you agree with the fundamental premise of all of this, that the group in itself, Donovan and Rudy was tapped out in a, uh, in the concept of trying to win a championship. So Justin says, hey, we were, tapped, we, we were tapped out, but he actually, I think, means it on the backside as a front office, we were tapped out. We'd gone through three cycles, hadn't been able to make any picks, hadn't been able to make any trades, hadn't been able to sign much of anyone, weren't able to move anyone. There was nothing available. There was no route. We talked about this, that the first thing that we thought the Jazz would do in the offseason is they would take those pieces, Royce, Boyan, Jordan, Mike, run them around the league and see if there was a route by which you could improve a team around Donovan and Rudy by moving some of those pieces. And it seems to be clear that the answer to that was no. And so at that point is where I think Justin Zanuck's talking about a touch point to pivot. A little athletic greens for you. Um, Sorry, just took a sip. Uh, Allergies killing me all of a sudden. Anybody else? Um, and that's where you're asset poor. You're not in the conversations. You don't have a route to, by which to change the team. And you have at that point, what Justin Zanuck is calling the touch point to pivot. And the touch point to pivot is frankly, the Rudy Gobert trade. And part two of it is the decision that you're not going to be able to build around Donovan Mitchell either because Donovan Mitchell isn't going to guarantee that he's going to be here for the whole rebuild or that you're just not going to be, that the window doesn't get big enough. This was the first two parts of yesterday's presser that I think were really, like, we knew this, we've talked about, but we heard it from them. Team that didn't believe in each other. I'm using the phrase scars of the path. A team that lacked resolve. So you've got to improve it. You've got to do something to alter it, to change it, to give it that resolve, to hopefully alter it, and there's no path for it. That you're tapped out. That you, with no money, with no draft picks, with actually draft assets you're going to lose because of the Derek Favors trade, with not any really young players coming up that are going to change the outcome of the roster without any young players that you actually want to trade, that anybody wants to trade for, that at that point, you're tapped out. And so this is the touch point to pivot. And the pivot is a pivot to do what they're calling is open up a window for a title. And that's how do you do that? How do you open up a window for a title? And what is that window? And this is going to be our most difficult Job, not job, 
mindset as a fan base. We'll continue and break that down here on Locked on Jazz. All right, so we're opening up a window. This is the, the, the key comment, so after those two parts. We're opening up a window to compete for a title. Well, it's certainly not a window that's open tomorrow. And so for us as fans, and I kind of stumbled on this the other day on the show and was talking to people about this yesterday at the golf event for Salt Lake Community College. Um, And that is that we think of season, everyone asks me, how are the Jazz going to be this year? Right? Oh my gosh, what are we going to be like this year? We've always, because we've been such a winning franchise, have always viewed seasons as October, whatever, 16th to April 15th, and then the playoffs. We are now on a 36 to 48 month journey of evolving, developing, finding assets, moving assets, finding pieces that are important for the long run, adding pieces through the draft, adding a piece through a trade, using our assets and flexibility, because we have the law, as Justin said yesterday, we have more unprotected picks than any team in the NBA between now and 2019. Hopefully can it attain another one or two. We have the, in, in what Justin was talking about, is that we have to have the greatest use of flexibility and assets. So if you're the Utah Jazz and you're going to win a title, try to win a title, You're not going to do it the way the Lakers or the Knicks or someone else is going to win a title, which is to just sign free agents. You're going to have to do it through the draft and trade, and you do it by an acquisition of assets, getting a tranche of different pieces to your puzzle, and to try to take the pieces that you have at the current time and get the maximum value in return for the organization. And they did that. They took Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell got the maximum amount of asset. They went from un- no flexibility, not in a conversation to a state to where they're going to be in every conversation that ever takes place. And you're, the phrase with that Justin and Danny were using is you're opening up a timeline with a maximum window. And so for us, I think what you're talking about is we're, We have to view the next 36 to 48 months as fans as this extended run. We're now doing, you know, we might be running the Wasatch back, frankly. Not just a marathon. And this journey, and and there's just going to be, like, it's going to be hard for us to cycle. Like, because we like to take each night, pinpoint it, analyze it, break it down. And sometimes it's going to be that Ubaji added a like finished with the left hand at the rim. Like, oh, it's development. Like, oh, that's important. Or Ubaji suddenly passed off a drive dribble that he hadn't passed off before. Um, You know, he actually can really shoot it off the move right now, so that's probably not a skill. Or he just comes out doing that. We're like, oh, um, maybe that Lowry Markkinen's gained confidence in this play in Eurobasket when he's been so brilliant after really being kind of broken down in Chicago and then a bit piece in... Um, it, that he was in Cleveland as, you know, an interesting piece and his unique skill set of seven feet, be able to defend multiple plays, shoot from the outside, put it on the deck, play make, pretty special talent. I've always been a huge Lowry marketing fan, so this is like kind of fitting for me, but, um, you know, pretty unique talent. Well, maybe he just, you know, obviously playing Croatia is a little different than playing, you know, the Golden State Warriors, but maybe he just finds himself some confidence and we see this uh, along the way. And Colin Sexton learns how to be a little bit better playmaker's piece, or maybe not, and then Colin Sexton gets moved. Five things to know about Colin Sexton is at utahjazz.com. Ryan did a nice job on that. Also, Lowry Markinen. Um, five things available for you as well. So, I think that when you look at the window for a title, what they're basically saying is we're, we're going to try to win a title, and the way we could, our window, we didn't, we had a group that didn't believe in itself that were impacted by scars of the past and were tapped out. And so now we're going to take all of these picks and we're going to open up a window for a title. But when? And that's probably not till, 
I don't know. I mean, my viewpoint is 03, 04, 05, but 2022, 23, 2023, 24, 24, 25, and maybe 25, 26, four year run of like acquiring our own draft picks before we vault. And we're probably moving very slightly up the ladder. Like, you know, from a 20 win to a third, to a 28 win, to a 32 win, to a 38 win team. And then you can go. I don't know. I made that up. And maybe that's not congruent to the timeline that they're thinking, but like that's to me probably what this journey is. Now, the team we have constructed right now could win 45, 40 to 45 games. So, you know, who knows? Maybe we go shoot for the playing game right now. I don't feel like as an organization that we need to do that. If you're Sacramento or Minnesota or one of these places that's had tremendous failures and not been in playoffs for many, many years, I would think that maybe you you have to go play for the play-in right now and just to engage your fan base. But I think our fan base is smart enough to understand and to see where we're going with this and just have to change our mindset into a journey and looking for the window of the title for the title down the road. Um, you know, you're opening up the maximum thing of that. The final and most honest comment that was made in the day was I asked whether or not there were paths of previous franchises that they thought was particularly good to their model. And I didn't really get an answer except for the fact that Justin Zanuck basically said you have to make good decisions. And that's really the truth of it. You're going to get three or four shots at a good draft pick and you got to hit on probably two or three of them. You're going to get probably five to seven shots at mid-range draft picks. And you've got to hope that you find a Devin Booker, Kawhi Leonard, Clay Thompson, Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert. It's not uncommon to find. I mean, it's still harder than doing it in the top five, but you can still find an all star. And we've got to, and you've got to hit on that. You've got to make the trade that is the perfect complement to your team that adds resolve, right? Like that helps the team become that team that has resolve. So it's going to be. And, and decisions are going to be fascinating to analyze and look at and see why they did them. Um, I also asked if there was a type of player they were looking at and got rebuked badly for a bad question because Danny Ainge said they want good players. Fair enough. I was wondering if something such as positional size or shooting or if there was a characteristic that they thought was going to be the signature of this rebuild. I think it's going to be positional size, frankly. I've heard that phrase enough that that was what I was expecting the answer to be. Um, didn't get it. I got good players. So what you're really saying is we want good players. So that's yesterday's presser. And it was really interesting and really straightforward and really transparent. It was also, by the way, I believe... A signature of Ryan Smith is bringing things directly to you. I think it was available at utahjazz.com streaming. You know, Ryan really believes in taking things directly to you, the fan. And so you're going to continually see that uh, throughout. All right, it is Locked on Jazz, your team every day. Thanks for all the comments in the comments section. And as well, thank you for those. Hit me up at DLock09 on Twitter and give me your thoughts on this. And uh, feel free, on uh, before we're done on YouTube, to kind of continue the chat room for a minute or two and give me thoughts on the different comments, the kind of key comments of the day. Uh, we didn't believe in each other. A group of players that didn't believe in each other, that we were tapped out, leading to a touch point, to a pivot, to open a window for a title. Those were the four biggies. Share your final thoughts on them. It is Locked On Jazz, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.